All right, welcome into the Online Enquirer podcast, Jeremy Warner, and today we have an excited Michael Tua. Just uh, just talking the last you know day or so with Mike about the potential of a uh, Tomislav Ivicic, and uh, he's very excited about the possibility. So we figured we'd bring you on, Mike. How are you? As Illinois adds its tenth scholarship player to the uh, to the 2024-25 roster. I'm well, man. I'm well, and this is this is one that you know I was hoping would would close because of, I think what it means for not only the team, but kind of similar to Humber house, just what it, what it allows you to do with your, with your personnel. We, we talked weeks ago um, and really in the last month about what they needed at the five spot. And it was ideally going to be low maintenance, but high impact, high efficiency, skilled. And that's exactly what you get with, with Tommy. I, I think, you know, skilled in seven one will excite you, regardless. But I think what excites me the most, I think really outside of the skill set, is the environment he developed in, uh, playing overseas, um, the the league, right, the competition level, who he's playing against, um, you know, the trial by fire aspect of that. Um, but but look, spacer can pass you know, can, can guard one-on-one -on -one in the post. Uh, now he's not Rudy Gobert by any means, but at seven, one, and with his size, it allows him to, to be, you know, to have single coverage down there and not have another guy that needs to, to come over and help. So that's, that's huge. Um, but like when we list all those attributes, why is that important? Right. We can throw a spacer out there and stretches the floor and can pass and can guard one-on-one -on -one in the post is like all those things create advantages. And the more advantages you create, the more the opposing team has to play out of character. And the more guys you have on the team that help you, you know, play with more advantages, the better chance you have at winning games. And that's that's been a deliberate thing for them this offseason is going and getting guys that are multifaceted and versatile because it allows you to play in different ways and tinker with different lineups. And I think that's only going to help them. We'll do a film review here, so we'll dive into it there, Mike. But when you kind of turn down the film and you're, and you're going through it, what were the questions you have and, and how did he emphatically answer them? Because I, I know you are excited about it. Yeah, well, I think you look at it one of two ways, right? When you hear about an international prospect, and there's been a few that have come through, right, at Illinois that haven't really panned out. But, you know, part of it is like the, say, the lineage, I guess, where I, I knew when I was about to watch him that – with his brother, you know, knowing his brother can play like his brother's a good player. They're twins, right? Like there's gotta be some sort of overlap. And when I watched him, I actually came away more impressed with Tommy than I did with when I watched big Z this year. And part of that is like, you know, when you watch him, you know, offensively, he was typically used when they ran actions, he was typically used as a screener and you know, that resulted in a lot of slips and a lot of pops in uh, a lot of dives. But where I was most encouraged watching him was how he played off script, like how he played through motion, how he played when things broke down. And there's just a certain level of IQ that guys overseas possess because they have to play a certain way at a younger age. And when I when you hear the phrase – Hey, he knows how to play or, Hey, he has feel for the game. It's especially important with bigs because sometimes what happens with bigs and maybe you've seen this over the years is it's not about whether or not like your ability to shoot or your ability to pass or your ability to rebound. It's where do I go? Right. Am I in the way? Do mm -hmm. I need to get out of the way? Am I kind of just clogging up the paint? Now am I kind of out in no man's land at 15 feet taking up space? And then when you watch him, like, there's just an inherent innate ability for him to know exactly where to be on the floor, what is too much, what's not enough. And that's that's how he gets a lot of his production, just from his, his overall feel of the game. All right, so this offseason, in the front court, Illinois has added Avishic, Hamrick House, Trey White, I guess you could say, in the front court, Jake Davis, I guess you could say, in the front court, Kerry Booth, and Merez Johnson. But let's let's focus on Hamrick House, Avishic, um, Kerry Booth and Marez Johnson. What excites you about the fit of Avishich with all, with all those other pieces? 
Well, I think the first thing that sticks out is the fact that, you know, again, kind of similar to Hum Rickhouse, right? He doesn't take away from these other guys. And you could say he may take away minutes, sure, but you still want to be able, if you're Carrie or you're Merez or you're Ben, when you do play, that you're playing to your strengths, right? And I think let's just for Ben, for example, when you have Tommy out there and he can be a spacer, allows Ben to play more at the four. Ben can obviously play at the five as well. But when Tommy's out there and Ben's out there, more space for Ben to isolate if he needs to. More space for Ben to go and have more catch and shoot opportunities. Uh, for for carry, right? Again, like you don't have to be dependent on to guard five men to guard the post. And I think that's an area where Kerry could definitely grow there eventually, but I'm not sure he's quite ready for that. And we saw that with Coleman this year, right? Coleman was much more better suited to guard fours, but the way the roster was constructed and the way your personnel was, Coleman had to guard fives. Part of that is why you how you wanted to play on offense. Uh, and then for Merez as well, if he does play with Tommy, if they do play at the same time or if they stagger minutes, if they do play together, like it allows Merez to go in there and just kind of like be an athlete. Yeah. Right, go be an athlete, you know, be a menace on the glass. All that's important to where you don't put too much on Merez's plate because he has so much skill around him where he can just go and eat, right? Go and eat doing what he does best. So, yeah, I, like, look, when you came into this offseason, you know, you, you really kind of felt like you had to thread the needle between, you know, bolstering up your, let's call it interior defense, and still having the skill that you need on the perimeter, or I say on the perimeter, but at that five position to be able to do what you want to do offensively. And I think they they nailed it with Tommy. I'm wondering for you, Mike, um, you've seen some of these European guys come over. Um, the transition like for him, Avisha, who's, who's 20 years old, he's got maturity to his game. He's not a string bean here. He's listed at 230, 250 pounds. Um, how does it all translate uh, to the Big Ten, what you see from him? Well, he's going to be 21 years old by the time the ball tips in October, November. But look, the, the biggest hurdle for high school guys, for younger international guys, I think, that come over to uh, to the Big Ten is the speed of the game. And that's, that's, that's true anytime you, quote unquote, go up a level. And Look, the Adriatic League and, and European basketball in general, it's not it's not the pace of the NBA per se, but you know, you still have to be able to process at a really high level. So when we when we say, hey, the speed of the game, you know, you can go in there, like Merez, Merez Johnson can quote unquote keep up with the speed of the game, right? He's a good enough athlete and can run around and but it's what the speed does mentally to you. And your ability to process with that speed. And that's where I think Visich is not going to have as much of an issue coming over here is because he's had years, and especially this past year, playing in a high-level league where you have to be able to not only keep up with the speed and keep guys in front and run the floor, but process, make quick decisions because gaps close quicker. Um, you know, guys close out quicker and you got to be able to get your shot off all that stuff. And and the fact that he's already done that at the level he's done that at makes me feel like, again, he's going to be kind of ready out of the box to, to come in and make an impact at Illinois. How do you uh, expect Brad Underwood to kind of deploy all these pieces? I mean, offensively, defensively, what do you expect it to look like and how they play? Yeah. I mean, some things are going to be matchup dependent, like, like they always are. Um, you know, I think, in terms of who you deploy and how you deploy it, you know, Tommy and Ben are, are going to kind of eat, I think eat up the lion's share of, of those front court minutes. And then, you know, for, for Carrie and Merez, it's, it's for both of them, it's going to be predicated on their development and how quickly they develop and how quickly they find their niche on this team. So can I take a know, minute? Can I carry yeah. Booth and Merez Johnson, highly ranked guys coming off your bench in the front court. Yeah, it's 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 one of the better front court rotations in the in the league. I mean, Michigan's obviously bolstered theirs. I don't want to say Indiana's bolstered theirs. I mean, Balo's obviously great, but you lose where. Um, so however you want to trade that out. Um, but yeah, you know, look, it's regardless. Like for Booth and, and for Merez, uh, it's hard for young guys to 
play significant minutes in this league. And I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase that. It's hard for young guys to play significant minutes in this league for really good teams, mm-hmm. right? You know, if you're not winning a ton of games, then, then maybe you see those, those guys having more of an impact, but um, that's just kind of what I'm fascinated by is how they play stylistically. I mean, I would imagine whether it's Marez, whether it's Tommy, whether it's Ben, what, like you're going to play a lot of drop defensively um, in ball screens. Interestingly enough, Tommy switched one through five at times um, this off season, or I mean this past season. And what was kind of fascinating when you look at him defensively and how he graded out his most efficient area was in isolation. Yeah. And, and sometimes they, they would do, you know, what would be called like a triangle switch where, you know, you have a guard guarding the guard and then big man comes up and sets a ball screen and then guard comes off with the ball. And then Tommy would switch onto the guard guard goals, guards, the rolling big, and it would basically be funneled into another big under the basket. So then the guard would pass off the rolling big to the other big and then kick out to the opposite corner to guard the other guard. So like, Again, all that type of stuff. Like they played Tommy in different ways too, where they hard hedge him sometimes. He definitely played in drop. I'd say he played in drop the majority of the time. Um, but I think that's going to be across the board for these guys. Now, Kerry is probably going to play, I'd say, a little bit more at the four. Um, Ben's probably going to play a little bit more at the four. But how they tinker with that and who slides in, right? Like when, when Tommy's out at the five, does Ben slide to the five? Is it split between – Hey, if Tommy plays 15 minutes or plays 25 minutes, let's say, then those other 15 minutes of the five, there's, you know, eight for home Rick house, knowing that he's getting the majority at the four and then, you know, seven to 10 from a res. Like I, we'll see how that all shakes out, but it's probably the hundredth time I said this on this podcast, we can talk about 10 guys, 11 guys, man, it's going to be eight ish. So we'll, we'll see how it pans out. You feel that, guys? Warmer, sunnier days are calling. And fuel up for them with Factors No Prep, No Mess Meals. Meet your wellness goals in time for summer thanks to the menu of chef-crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart and Keto, or my favorite, Protein Plus. Factors fresh, never-frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, you always have time to enjoy nutritious, great tasting meals make today the day you kickstart a new healthy routine with factor what are you waiting for with 35 different meals and more than 60 add-ons to choose from every week you'll always have new flavors to explore so you can crush your wellness goals this may with dietitian approved meals and ingredients that you can trust so treat yourself to restaurant quality meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon shrimp and blackened salmon and the best part you keep kitchen time to a minimum factor meals are ready in two minutes no shopping prepping cooking or cleaning up so enjoy effortless support for your lifestyle choose from six menu preferences to help you manage calories maximize protein intake avoid meat or simply eat well balanced so head to factormeals.com slash illini50 and use code illini50 to get 50 percent off your first box plus 20 percent of your next month that's code illini50 at factormeals.com slash illini50 to get 50 percent off your first box plus 20 percent off your next month We've seen a lot of great teams go overseas and get some really big impact pieces. Gonzaga, Duke, Baylor has done it. Arizona, Tommy Lloyd, UCLA has really done it here recently. Um, Orlando Antigua has gone outside of the States. We know that, um, especially in the Caribbean. He obviously has the connection here to Avicic. But Jeff Alexander has been working this for a while. And and as you said, Mike, like we've seen some guys not work out. Matisse Vasil, famously. Benjamin Bossman Verdonk made it. A decent impact. Nicola Moretti comes over here, doesn't make a big impact in his year. Zachary Perrine was here for like two months, played one game. Uh, now he's an NBA draft prospect. But this feels like it's been a big buildup to this. And and they're in on Igor Demon. We'll see if that works out or not. But um, what is the significance, you think, of, of Illinois going overseas and, and getting a guy that, that we feel pretty high on here? I mean, look at the way the game of basketball has evolved, right? And there's so much emphasis on skill nowadays more than, you know, in the, probably in the eighties and the nineties, like there's just the ability to dribble pass and shoot is, is uh, you know, at a premium. And so I feel like when you, when you look at like what the MO has been for foreign born players, 
over the years. Like, let's just go back to the 90s, right? And what Tony Kukoc added to the Bulls, right? He came in, you're like, whoa, 6'11", can step out, can shoot it. And like Drazen Petrovic, like these guys were – Vladi. Vladi, another great example Vlade. where they come in and there's just like a really – like that is their MO. They're just the the skill level. And then you move your way into the 2000s and there's like the Pejas, there's the Dirks where it's like, man, like you can really have a seven footer who is multifaceted offensively, can shoot. Like Dirk was insane in the mid range, obviously with the fallaways, the one foot turnarounds, the threes, obviously. And that's a guy who was not a very athletic player. And, and Dirk really not like really a strong player either. Like brute strength wasn't his... His, uh, you know, I think his MO either. And then you have Manu, right? Manu comes in and changes the way that we, you know, <laughs> like deal with like stride stops and Euro steps. Like he kind of ushered that in. Tony Parker came over and it's like, man, these small guards, like the angles that you can finish around the rim when you're not a, a really athletic player. Like, and then you look at just the NBA in general now where it's, it's Jokic, it's Doncic, it's Giannis, it's, you know, Wemby comes in, it's, there's just this whole new wave and a need for, for skill uh, with the way the game of basketball is developed. So there's no, there's no, I mean, I think it's honestly, it's not as much of a tapped market as it maybe should be in college basketball. Like there's a lot of really good players over there that I think would be would be enticed by the the prospects of coming over the states. Yeah, it's just off the top of my head, but it feels like four of the top ten prospects in this draft are are, are international guys. Like I I don't know off the top of my head, but like Alex Sar is a big one. Like Topic is, is a big one. Like yeah. um there, there's just a bunch of guys that um are, I don't know if those guys are going to come over here because they can just play overseas and that's why I'm interested with, with Demon and, and they can come over here and be a lottery pick and make good money over there. But um it is a huge market of basketball. It is a global game now. As you mentioned, like the four top candidates for MVP are all overseas guys. Now I say overseas, Shea Gilgis Alexander from Canada. Um, but you know, Wemby, all those guys, like there's so much talent that is now coming from everywhere. So you might as well get get in on the action. I mean, look at I think between the NBA, the NFL, and the MLB, the the you know, the the pool of talent. I think in this sport crosses continents, I think better than, and, and like maybe you can make an argument for baseball, but what, what's interesting and correct me if I'm wrong here, you're the, you're more of a baseball guy than I am, but I feel like baseball prospects come over to the States because there's more structure, right? Like there's guys that play in the Dominican guys that, you know, you're like, Whoa, there's, there's talent, there's raw talent. Now let's bring him into more of like a structured environment. And then they're off to the races Whereas it's almost the opposite for basketball sometimes. And obviously, you know, a, a college program and, and, you know, some of the AAU circuit stuff is, is organized in a way. But when you talk about like in Visage, for, for example, right, like that is a really structured environment yep. that he's coming from playing in that league. And that's kind of the pool of talent that you can draw over because these guys are, you know, he plays for, for KK Derby, right? And then that that KK Derby team has like a U19 team and then like a junior level team. And they grow up in that system. And, you know, very much like baseball where you come over here and you're in a farm system coming up. So that's I guess that's kind of my my thought on it is like this pool of talent is insane yeah. when you think about how it's translated to the NBA, what mock drafts look like now compared to maybe, you know, 1996. Um, it's crazy. And I think it's only going to, it's only going to increase with the, with the need for skill. All right, Mike, um, let's talk about the rest of the roster. They got a couple scholarship spots available three. Uh, I doubt they get to fill three, but there's a clear need. Number one in, in the backcourt or on the wing, uh, what skill set does Illinois need? And in, in that guard, that playmaker to kind of tie this all together. Yeah. I mean, we, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I think the, the first, the first thing that sticks out, if you're and if you're if you're following the trend for for Brad Underwood, it's going to be positional size. Um, so whether you want whether or not you want to label someone as a two or a three, like they're going to be a pretty sizable two or three. Um, and and I think when you look at the makeup of the roster, having a guy that you can count on to pack somewhat of a scoring punch. Now I don't think you need to go out and find like a. 23 a game guy, even though like there are 
There's not many of that. I don't think there's any in the portal. Uh, Terrence Shannon was number three in the NCAA in scoring last year. I don't, I don't think you're finding that. Yeah. You're not. And so you need to find a guy that can score the basketball and score the basketball in a variety of ways. And whether that's the back downs that they play in, um, you know, the ability to, I think, play fast. That's, that's a factor as well. Like having someone that if they haven't traditionally played fast at the previous school that they're at, like they're going to have to get used to that because that's, that's been kind of a focal point for the way, you know, I think these teams, these Brad Underwood teams have wanted to play over the years. And you can look last year, like their pace was kind of middle of the pack, their tempo, I guess, Illinois it, nationally. But part of it was like they were either scoring on fast breaks in the first six, seven seconds of the shot clock, or they were really milking those possessions to find the matchups they wanted. There was no, there was no kind of in between there. So, um, so yeah, finding a guy that can put pressure on the rim that can play in these back downs that has that positional size. Like, I think that's the the type of guy you want to go after. Uh, Illinois is in the mix. We know at least uh, for Kadari Richmond out of Seton Hall, who 24 seven sports has is the number one transfer um, him. Illinois has been attached to Wuga Poplar. We'll see out of Miami, really good shooter. What do you think of the potential fit of both those two? Well, both are good fits. Um, different players. Yeah. And, you know, a little bit. I mean, Wuga was a guy that you know, definitely can play in ball screens and can, can I think pack some of that scoring punch? Uh, Miami runs ran some off the ball actions for him too. Kadari, Kadari's Kadari's really good, man. You mentioned he's the number one number one player in the portal right now, according to two four seven. But you know he has a a control of the game. I think um, part of what I was alluding to there was Kadari hasn't been used to playing fast. Kadari kind of plays at Kadari's speed. And so that's going to be something where if, you know, if they do end up getting him, uh, he's going to have to, to go a little bit, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's so good in the half court. Um, but when you have a guy like Kylan Boswell, who I think can really get out and is kind of untapped in, in that, in that regard, like he's going to have to switch some things up, but you you like the fact that although, you know, he's, he's been super low volume with, with, with his three point uh, percentage, or I guess his, his three point attempts over the years. I mean, I don't think he's, He's never hit over 23s in a season. Um, he was 44%, I think, two years ago um, from three. But, you know, the rest of it's kind of been like in the high 20s, low 30s. And But what's encouraging is, is he is like an 80% mm -hmm. free throw shooter. So you know there's at least something there that's typically a decent barometer. So um, both guys would be really good gets. I mean, Kadari goes without saying, you know, you land the – that would be the one that – you know, we definitely grab the most the most of national headlines. Yeah. Oh, if there's been some other really good gets that Illinois already got that that have kind of I think flown under the radar. Yeah, I think Avishic, Hummerkhaus, the last two have been pretty significant uh, that maybe haven't registered nationally. If you add somebody like Richmond, like all of a sudden, I think people are like, oh, this is the team to watch in the Big Ten. Like, like it's not just Indiana um, and Michigan and some of these other schools. Like that would be headline grabbing, and, and most importantly, Mike be a really good fit i mean six six two i mean kind of built like uh a, a terrence shannon maybe not quite as big but can really get downhill tough physical gets after it on the glass a great, great defender, great defender as well all big east defensive team so there's a lot to like with him and if he does play with pace man like i, I would sit there and say look what shannon did in transition like you can get easy points doing that man yeah and, and i think again i think they with boswell and with richmond I think you're, you're going to see more ball screens this year. Um, and especially when you have guys like Hum Rickhouse and you have guys like Tommy, like you're going to want those guys setting ball screens because they, you know, both of them, I think, roll well to the basket. Both of them can make quick decisions if the ball is fed to them in short rolls. Um, both of them can obviously pop. So I think that's kind of how you end up tying a lot of this together. But but yeah, those those two guys would be would be tremendous ads. Uh, I was thinking about this, Mike, like the 12th and 13th scholarships, potentially like those could be tough, It'd be tough to fill out a roster. That's why some developmental guys probably aren't such a bad thing. Like Jason Jackson, I thought having an equal Moretti, like those kind of players that are, are bought into, you know, a, a development process. Cause I don't know how many guys are, are 
will be bought into that in the transfer portal. Uh, but there's some value there of, of having a skill set you're intrigued by um, or, or just a veteran that wants to to be on a part of a winner. It, it, it could be really difficult. Like if you're going to do the 12 scholarship to find a guy to fill that. It's hard because then you want to get, you know, the last ads, if you're trying to fill out your roster, a lot of times the character element of it has to be the highest, especially if they're in a developmental plan. If, you know, they are that truly that kind of 11th, 12th, 13th guy. You've heard me say it before. Those are the guys a lot of times where if they don't have the high character that can kind of, you know, cannibalize your locker room. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's, that's always super important. I think about like, you know, like a mid-major veteran that's just like, Hey man, I just want to be part of a big program. Um, I want to see, you know, I want to go somewhere where maybe I can go to an NCAA tournament, uh, bust my butt in practice, help the scout team. Like that type of person, I think would be, would be a really good fit at this stage. You know, you're obviously going to fill, you know, whether it's with Kadari Richmond or with some of these other guys that we've talked about, fill that like high impact role. But then the rest of it can't be like, hey, let's close this out with two more high impact guys. Because then you start getting into the diminishing returns um, element of this. So you want to like what Illinois has done to this point, I think is I think better than a lot of teams in the Big Ten is really carefully constructed a team. Yeah. Like every part of it is like, makes sense, makes sense. And also if you're looking at the other guys that they've brought in, it's like, it makes this guy's addition makes sense for that guy and vice versa. So, you know, I'll be curious to see how they, how they finish it out, but, but there is a ton of importance in it because you don't want to get a bad apple and, and have them kind of ruin what you, uh, what you built. All right, Mike, my last one for you. Um, this is going to be a great competition for roles. Kind of, kind of, as you talked about, like the rotation, like at the end of the day, there's probably going to be eight or nine guys at most uh, in a rotation. Uh, when you have all this talent, all these new pieces, I, I think it's going to be a fascinating summer. But is there anyone's role who who interests you most going into the summer? I think we know what Boswell, Hummer Kaus, uh, Big T are going to be, uh, but the rest of it, like, is there anybody whose role really intrigues you the most? Yes. And I think, you know, who it is. Um, and, and if you want to like put guys almost head to head in a sense where you're like, Hey, you know, between this guy and this guy, like who ends up edging the person out for minutes, like my head to head on that is Ty Rogers versus anyone, because you look at what Ty offers. Right. And I know you like, you know, the, the easy rebuttal is going to say, well, he can't space the floor. He's not a shooter. And that kept him off the floor at times last year, but he still played a decent amount. And mm -hmm. the reason why he played was because he's about the right things. He, you know, has positional size. He's tough. He guards and he rebounds his butt off. And in my experience around college basketball, those guys tend to find a way to get on the floor. So who is he going to take minutes away from is going to be what's fascinating to me. Cause I think he is going to take minutes away from somebody. Um, and I think like, again, having a guy like Ty is only going to kind of raise the level of competition and practice. And, um, I think for, for guys like Trey white and for some of these guys coming in, it's like, Whoa, like this is the level I got to be at every day in practice. Cause I know Ty is going to bring that. Like, that's why, you know, yes, there were departures for sure, but retaining that dude and then Dre, like the way Dre plays as well, like both those guys like that is really important because I the one thing you know with those two is like they're going to play like their lives are on the line yeah. and and that's that's really important and then like a separate a separate thing I'll mention on like the Ty Rogers note because we talked about Tommy like what it what this addition does for Ty is huge because I don't want to say gone are the days but it's going to be a lot more difficult for teams to put their five man on tie because, and maybe you, maybe you and pipe touched on this um, when you, when you did a pot earlier, but how that shift things around for shifts things around for tie is like, you know, yes, you'll have maybe the Indianas and the Michigans where it's like, okay, Indiana goes renew on Tommy and they go Balo on tie. And, you know, in that case, now you have kind of things that were similar to last year, 
But the ripple effect of that is like the further you go down the lineup, there is going to be a mismatch somewhere. Yep. Because you're having to allocate resources towards Ty, right? Or, or like allocate your five man towards Ty. Like Hum Rickhouse is going to have a mismatch. Trey White's going to have a mismatch. Like that's kind of the the issues that they present. And then I think, you know, like there's going to be situations where, you know, it, against an Indiana, against a Michigan, where Wolf and Golden are playing together and they put Golden on Ty, they put Wolf on Tommy, and they they try to camp these guys out. They're going to do what they did starting in Columbus last year, where they put Ty at the five and Ty goes and sets ball screens. And then you have Tommy in the corner and you have Tommy as a spacer. Like that, that is, that's the thought process because you're going to have so many different ways that you can play. And that, and just because Ty is not a floor spacer. Like, I honestly think there's value, and this sounds crazy, but like there is value in having a one guy on the floor that is a is not a floor spacer because you alleviate the ability for teams to go, we're just going to switch one through five or switch everything. So now you have to have specific matchups. And when Balo is planted in the paint, as Ty gets more and more used to playing at the five or just or being guarded by fives, like you are now being able to set screens for Boswell, set screens for Hum Rickhouse, set screens for Ibisic, where there is no one there to help because you have a guy playing in the paint. So it's like the same reason why the Warriors have had so much success with Draymond is because yeah. you're like, all right, Draymond's a non-shooter. We're just going to park off. And then Draymond just becomes a, a DHO, ball screener, off ball screener. And these guys, if you lay wood, are coming off and have no one there. Or it's a late closeout. And if it's a late closeout, now I can attack it. So there's a little bit of value there. Like, I don't want this to be this whole thing where it's like, Ty can't shoot, Ty can't play. You're right. Because then the last thing that I'll mention is, what if he starts shooting them? Right? Like, if there's one thing I know about Ty Rogers is that he cares and he's maniacal with the way that he works. And so if you can come into a year and be like, hey, I know I'm not going to be guarded. And, and if I can hit, I'll even say 30% of my threes, catch and shoot, no one in the zip code, keep teams honest, that is like, it's on now. Like everyone says, find that 15-foot jumper. I'd rather have him find that. No, eight- find the three. Don't yeah. find the 15-foot jumper. Find the three. Hey, hit 25% of them. I'd take that. But like to me, that 8- to 10-foot runner, like I'd be watching yeah. Boo Boo Eclipse and – and, and really perfecting that. And I know he's worked at that. Yeah. I just think it's a confidence thing with him. But just to go back to your whole point, I love that he's still on the team. Yeah. I, I I just, I want Ty Rogers on my team. I think I've made that clear over and over again. And as you said, like somebody that has the standard, like Dre, I think can be that guy, but Ty has been in those battles, man. Right. Like I, I know Dre has played some in the postseason and made an impact, but Ty has been a big part of winning the last two years. And, and I still want a little bit of that continuity. And I, I still think there's – I keep going back to when when Terrence was out, man, you saw an offensive initiator, a guy who can put pressure on the rim, a guy who can get to the free throw line, a guy who can score and really help his team. And I think with the pieces around him, I think that can be unleashed a little bit. So I'm, I'm excited about Ty too. No, I agree. And I think, you know, what's really interesting about Dre and Ty is I think Dre was in the position that Ty was in last year yeah, in the offseason where you and I had a pod and I was like, Hey, I went back and watched that Arkansas game. Like, I'm just not sure Ty really knew who he was, right? Where do I go? Where do I stand? Where do I, am I short corner? Am I a dunker spot? Am I, okay, am I a screener? Am I, and then he just started to figure that out this year. Like he got guarded by fives and he got used to being guarded by fives. And I thought by the time that, you know, Purdue rolled around the second time, like he made Edie pay for it Mm -hmm. uh, on occasion. Right. And I think that's that Ty knows who he is now. I think um, now there's got self-aware like that. That's a, that's a good skill to have. Yeah. And I think, and if he does add like the, Hey, I'm going to hit a three every three games just so that you have to think about me out here. Like that's, that's a whole nother level now, but with Dre, it's like, you can tell, like they just kind of let him off the leash last year and they're like, Hey, go run around in the yard. Right. It was like, yeah, okay, some threes. All right, he just blew up a ball screen. He just – like, he's just kind of like – they just let him loose. And I think he's going to – the more he he gets reps and plays is like going to kind of figure out who he is too, 
So that's going to be fascinating to see as well. But again, like really, really happy to get both guys back. But but for sure, when you have a guy that's been in the program for multiple years, since you don't see that that often, um, retaining those guys who embody your culture is huge. By the way, I did not set Mike up for that. I, I It's Ty in my mind. It could be Trey White. I'm really interested to see what he brings, but I did not feed him the answer, Ty Rogers, just to, to be clear. So I mean, again, like I think it was, again, it was like it was pretty – you asked the question. I'm like, it's, I mean, in my mind, it's, it's Ty because I think he's been, you know, I think he's been forgotten a bit in a sense where it's like you're factoring in, okay, well, this guy's here and this guy's there. And then you have Ty, you know, I think Ty can still play 20 minutes a game on this team without question. Um, and there's going to be nights where it's more because of matchups or because of, you know, this, that, and the other. So still a lot of value with that guy. There's no question. Michael Tulip, uh, appreciate you joining us. Give us some insight and uh, a breakdown of Avicic. Uh, we'll have a film room breakdown for everybody on the VIP side of things, so uh, we'll learn more about him during that. Mike, appreciate the time. We'll catch up with you soon, man. Thanks, man.